Hi guys. It is a lovely, I guess, summer evening here. It is the last night of August. It will be September in one hour, and I think we might be heading down to the 40s tonight uh, here at Bugs in a Jar Farm and the Collapse of Global Industrial Civilization. And I'm on my second computer, and now I see the batteries are ready to crash on my second computer. So I'll probably be blabbing when the battery goes off. Uh, so it is, for a few more minutes, uh, Wednesday night, August 31st, 2022, and I was going to uh, get into this book review. All right, the cat is making a, an appearance. We've never seen the cat. She looks at the camera. She doesn't know what to think of that cat as a camera. Yes. All right. You're going to join us. It is a crowded table. This is Rascal, by the way, the, uh, that she seems like she is terrified of the camera. That's Sancho, I think you know who Sancho Panza is. Sancho Panza does not like you up here. Anyway, I better, what was I saying? I was going to, uh, look at this book review of this, of this new book called An Inconvenient Apocalypse by Robert Jensen and Wes Jackson here in The Guardian, that little lefty rag, The Guardian. And uh, so I'm reading this. So it's, it's an article about the collapse of global industrial civilization, how the entire planet is doomed. And in the third paragraph of this book review about Robert Jensen and Wes Jackson's new book, they, 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 they introduce Robert Jensen. This, this is my hero, Robert. I have two interviews with Robert Jensen. I think you can find them on Collapse Chronicles. This is The Guardian introducing Robert Jensen. Robert Jensen is a longtime journalist who has written books on ecology, masculinity, and radical feminism. He has received backlash for propounding exclusionary and harmful views against transgender people, specifically targeting transgender women. And in response to the criticism, he has doubled down on these viewpoints, continuing to promulgate them. And that is where I stopped reading the book review about the inconvenient apocalypse because the Guardian is a hell of a lot more uh, concerned about the, uh, the genius uh, Robert Jensen's views on transgender people as they are about the collapse of a planet. Don't get me going. Uh, I could, uh, and, and not a rant against trans, a rant against the, the, the little lefty media. I'm, I'm getting sick and tired of them. I wish I could reach in and, and rip back my donation I just sent to the Guardian last week. I'm sick and tired of them. But anyway, I am in a punchy mood tonight. So before I get myself in any more trouble, <clears throat> we're going to go over to Time Magazine. We're going to see if Time Magazine can make it through an article without talking about how the people they interview, what their opinion of transgender people are. Okay, take it away, Time Magazine. This was like the fifth biggest story on the planet today, I believe. Where we will end up living as the planet burns, where we will end up living as the planet burns. I love it. The, the name of this reporter, her name is Gaia. Gaia Vince. So Gaia, Gaia is writing for Time Mag. I didn't know Gaia was now a reporter. Gaia is going to explain to us where we will end up living as the planet burns. Uh, probably one of these batteries will collapse. All right, take it away, Gaia, <clears throat> in Time Magazine. While nations rally to reduce their carbon emissions and try to adapt at risk places to hotter conditions, there is an elephant in the room. 
anyone thinking the elephant is overpopulation, this is Time Magazine. You will not find the word overpopulation in the article. So we're talking about another elephant in the room. There is an elephant in the room. For large portions of the world, local conditions are becoming too extreme and there is no way to adapt. People will have to move to survive. And you are hearing this from a climate change refugee who moved from Austin, Texas to uh, Ithaca, New York. And now this computer is crashing and burning. There's nothing I can do, guys. Uh, I just, uh, I, I'm going to read this until the battery dies, and you can take over the link from here. <clears throat> over the next 50 years, hotter temperatures combined with more intense humidity are set to make large swaths of the globe lethal to live in. Fleeing the tropics, the coast, Austin, Texas, and formerly arable lands huge populations will need to seek new homes. You will be among them, or you will be receiving them. This migration has already begun. We have all seen the streams of people fleeing drought-hit areas in Latin America, Africa, Asia, and Texas where farming and other rural livelihoods have become impossible. I'm making that up a little bit about Texas, although, you know, Governor Abbott is supposed to be sending some of these migrants to New York. I have yet to see one of these migrants as hard as I have been looking for them. All right. The number of migrants has doubled globally over the past decade, and the issue of what to do about rapidly increasing populations of displaced people will only become greater and more urgent as the planet heats. We can and we must prepare, yes, by getting your ass out of Texas to the Finger Lakes of New York would be a good start. Developing a radical plan for humanity to survive a far hotter world would include building vast new cities in the more tolerable far north while abandoning huge areas of the unendurable tropics. It involves adapting our food, energy, and infrastructure to a changed environment and demography as billions of people are displaced and seek new homes. It's a good century to be a real estate agent, it sounds to me. I should go back into selling real estate to climate refugees. Our best, huh? our best, huh? our best huh? hope lies in cooperating as never before. Oh, yes, this is the kumbaya view that the Time Magazine kumbaya version of uh, the future. <clears throat> Cooperating as never before, decoupling the political map from geography. However unrealistic this sounds, however unrealistic this sounds, we need to look at the world afresh and develop new plans based on geology, geography, and ecology. In other words, identify where the fresh water resources are. Well, they used to be in the Finger Lakes till they all dried up. Where the safe temperatures are, where gets the most solar or wind energy, and then plan population, food, and energy production around that. The good news is there's plenty of room on the planet. There is plenty of room on the planet. Alex Jones will tell you we can fit the whole planet into the state of Texas, and I wish to hell that every human being on the planet would move to the state of Texas and leave the rest of the planet alone. 
please, everyone move to the state of Texas. You can all fit there. I'm going to stay here because I got the hell out of Texas. All right. The good news is there's plenty of room on planet Earth. If we allow 20 square meters of space per person around double the minimum habitable size of a house allowed under the International Residential Code, 11 billion people would need 220,000 square kilometers of land to live on. There would be plenty of room to house everyone on Earth in a single country. The surface area of Canada alone is 9.9 .9 million square miles, I mean square kilometers. Of course, I, meaning Gaia, of course, Gaia, I am not proposing anything as absurd, but this is something to reflect on if you are a fan of Alex Jones when it is claimed that a country is too full for more people. Now for the bad news. The bad news is that no place on earth will be unaffected by climate change. Everywhere will undergo some kind of transformation in response to changes in the climate, whether through direct impacts or the indirect result of being part of a globally interconnected biophysical and socioeconomic system. Extreme events are already occurring around the world and will continue to hit safe places. Some places, though, will be more easily adaptable to these changes, while others will become entirely uninhabitable fairly quickly. Bear in mind that many places will be uncomfortable, if not un intolerable, by 2050, around the lifespan of most mortgages. Yes, we need to start planning where we make our homes now. By 2100, it will be a different planet. So let's focus on some of the livable options. Yes, global heating is shifting the geographical position of our species temperature niche northwards, like from Texas to New York, and people will follow, yet right now, more and more people are moving from New York to Texas, Florida, and Arizona than the other way around. The, the, mig the net migration in the United States to this day is pouring in to Texas, Florida, and Arizona, the three fastest growing states, I think. More and more clueless morons pouring into Texas than any other state in the country, while Time Magazine, I, now I do agree with Time, at some point it's got, it's got to turn around and people are, are going to pull their heads out of their ass like I did how many years ago and, and get the hell out of Texas. But then we have this thing called winter up here anyway. The optimum climate for human productivity the best conditions for both agricultural and non-agricultural output turns out to be an average temperature of 11 to 15 degrees C. Of course, they don't put that in Fahrenheit for us clueless Americans. This, now I'm getting ready to lose my battery. This global niche is where human populations have concentrated for millennia including for the entirety of human civilization. So it is unsurprising that our crops, livestock, and other economic practices are ideally adapted to these conditions. The researchers show that depending on scenarios of population growth and warming, one to three billion people are projected to be left outside the climate conditions that have served humanity well over the past 6,000 years. They add that, quote, in the absence of migration, one-third of the global population is projected to experience mean average temperatures that are currently found mostly in the Sahara, close quote. 
as a general rule, people will need to move away from the equator and from coastlines, small islands, and arid or desert regions. Rainforest and woodlands are also places to avoid due to fire risks. Populations are going to shift inland towards lakes. Can you say the Finger Lakes? Higher elevations and northern latitudes. Yes. Looking at the globe, it is immediately clear that land is mainly distributed in the north. Less than a third of Earth's land is in the southern hemisphere, and most of that is either in the tropics or Antarctica. So the scope for climate migrants to seek refuge in the south is limited. Patagonia is the main option. I don't know what happened in New Zealand although it is already suffering from droughts, but agriculture and settlement there will remain possible as the global temperatures rise. The mainlands for opportunity for migrants, however, are in the north. Temperatures in these safer regions will rise and will rise faster at higher latitudes than at the equator, but the average absolute temperatures will still be far lower than in the tropics. Of course, climate disruption brings extreme weather and nowhere will be spared these increasingly common events. Canada reached temperatures of 50 C last year, making British Columbia hotter than the Sahara Desert. And then, a few months later, was hit by deadly floods and landslides that displaced thousands. Fires have blazed across Siberia's tundra, and melting permafrost is shifting unstable ground on which to build infrastructure. Yes, happily, however, the northern latitudes are already home to wealthier nations that generally have strong institutions and stable governments. Yes, that are among the best placed to build social and technical resilience to the challenges this century. Problematically, many of them have also struggled politically with immigration to a far greater extent than have many much poorer countries. Uh, and with a migrant crisis, crisis that is far smaller than the great climate migration we will see over the next 75 years, it may be more possible to shift a political social mindset in the space of a few years, however, than to return the tropics to habitability. Consider that most of Europe's nations rely on tens of thousands of migrant workers just to harvest the crops they grow today. With better agricultural conditions across the north, the need for labor will only increase. No, it won't because it's all getting turned over to robots. North of the 45th parallel, which runs through Michigan and North America, France, Croatia, Mongolia, there you go, Mongolia, and Xinjiang in China, for instance, will be the 21st century's booming haven. It represents 15% of the planet's area but holds 29% of its ice-free land and is currently home to a small fraction of the world's aging people. It's also entering that optimum climate for human productivity with mean average temperatures of around 13 degrees C. And of course, don't forget the inland lake systems, such as the Finger Lakes of New York. Inland lake systems, like the Great Lakes region, will see a huge influx of migrants reversing the previous exodus from these areas, as we will see, as the vast bodies of water should keep that region fairly temperate. Duluth in Minnesota on Lake Superior bills itself as the most climate-proof city in the U.S., although it is already dealing with fluctuating water levels. 
other upper Midwest cities around the lakes, including Minneapolis and Madison, are also likely to be desirable destinations. More southerly Midwestern cities face the threat of extreme heat waves. The University of Notre Dame's Global Adaptation Initiative researchers concluded that eight of the top ten cities facing the highest likelihood of extreme heat in 2040 are located in the Midwest, including cities from Detroit to Grand Rapids. Further east, locations get riskier quickly, but Buffalo and New York and Toronto and Ottawa look to be safe choices for migrants from the coast. And there you go. Prep, good lord guys, I can see, I can't believe my battery hasn't run out any second now. I did not realize this is a book length article, so if you're trying to figure out where to move, uh, then they uh, talk about, you know, living on the coast. Uh, good luck. Uh, obviously, you don't want to be on the coast. Much of the rest of the U.S. will be problematic for one reason or another. Uh, today's desirable locations such as Florida, California, and Hawaii will be increasingly deserted for the more pleasant climates of former Rust Belt cities that will experience a renaissance as a globally diverse community of new immigrants revitalizes them. Uh-huh. So Alaska actually looks like the best place to live in the U.S. Though in cities will need to be built there to accommodate millions of migrants heading for the newly busy Anthropocene Arctic. Yes, did you know that Kodiak Island, Alaska was named the lowest risk of climate events in the country by the Climate Resilience Screening Index? <clears throat> by 2047, Alaska could be experiencing average monthly temperatures similar to Florida today, according to an analysis of climate models. Uh, anyway. Good Lord, guys, this uh, goes on and on. Then they're talking about Greenland. I see nuke. N-U-U-K Greenland, I think, uh, didn't What's-His-Face already end up there? Uh, Canada, Siberia, Iceland, the Nordic nations, and Scotland will all continue to see benefits from global heating. Yep. Arctic vegetation will nearly double in the 2080s with an end to cripplingly cold winters, growing seasons in the Arctic will significantly expand. There you go. Uh, anyway, guys, this is a book-length article. Let's see if we can get to the end before this battery. Okay. Come on, battery. Wrapping up from Gaia, instituting global freedom of movement would boost national economies as well as saving or improving billions of lives. Open borders would, it is fair to assume, result in very large flows of people. Estimations range from a few million to more than one billion, and it could increase global GDP by tens of trillions of dollars. Among the catastrophic losses this century, we have so much potential to gain if we just open our minds to different ways of living, unsticking people from their fixed abodes. P. 
people will move in their millions this century, and right now we have a chance to make this upheaval work through a planned, imagined, peaceful transition to a safer, fairer world. We must try. And that was adapted from Gaia's new book, Nomad Century, How Climate Migration Will Reshape Our World, published by Flatiron Books. I love it. Flatiron Books Publishing, a woman named Gaia talking about Kumbaya, how, uh, how all of the rich North nations, we're just going to open our borders, open our arms, open our hearts to one billion people coming up here. We're going to give them free bus tickets when they get to the border. I mean, if you come into Texas, you get a free bus ticket all the way to Buffalo, well, all the way to New York. Uh, so... There you go. I, I think uh, Texas Governor Greg Abbott is, is a shining example of what they're talking about here. We're going to welcome these people in. We're going to give them a free bus ticket north. There you go. How can we be more welcoming than that? Free bus tickets. We got one billion free bus tickets heading to Kodiak Island as cities of millions of people springing up in Alaska this century. I don't know, does your intelligence ever get insulted by the mainstream media? This unadulterated horseshit coming out of Time magazine. Unadulterated horseshit. Every word, not, well not every word of it, you know what I'm saying. Anyway, Time magazine. I needed a good laugh tonight. All right, little dog, it's getting close till midnight, and uh, we got a long day of work. The tiny house is looking great, guys. The party starts in two weeks. Come up here to Bugs in a Jar and party like it's 1999 while you still can. Bye, guys.